Be your best piece of advice to a young chef who might have dyslexia? Um, to not be embarrassed about it, to be honest about it, and don't let it hinder you. You know, there's certain ways that you know you can just get away. You know, every, everyone has something that they're not stronger. You know, you get you get away with it. You can you, you can be better at other stuff. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Breaking Bread. This is the Birmingham-based food podcast presented by Food Obsessed Mates, Liam and Carl. I'm Liam, and a very warm welcome to this episode of Breaking Bread. Glad to have you with us. But to start, how I do every kind of intro, a massive thank you to everyone who listened to our last episode with Burning Bar and Rum. We had an absolutely incredible chat. And if you haven't heard that yet, go back and listen you really enjoy that especially if you like rum you'll enjoy it maybe if you're thinking of starting your own kind of business you'll enjoy it as well there's plenty of help and advice in their little story so go back and have a listen to that and if you are liking our podcast if you go over to what apple Podcasts, um, i think apple podcast is the only one that does let you review i'm not sure i always say wherever you listen to your podcast but i think it's just apple either way so if you listen on apple Please go on to your Apple Podcasts app and rate us five stars and leave us a really nice review. That would be amazing and would really help us get the word out there about how brilliant the Birmingham food and drink scene is. If you haven't been to our Instagram yet, make sure you go and have a little look at that. It's Breaking Bread Podcast UK. If you just search for that, you'll find our Instagram. We just have a lot of nice pictures of food and stuff like that. But we want to see your pictures of food too. So if you tag us at Breaking Bread Podcast UK, uh, maybe use the hashtag that we've been using is Brum Dime with us. Use that hashtag or tag us in it and we'll choose a couple each day. Maybe give them a little repost. We want to see your pictures of what you've been eating for dinner or some good brunch you've been eating out or any any pictures of food. Just tag, them, tag us in and let us have a look at them. So on to today's podcast, this is a really exciting episode for us, I think I say that every week, but this one is mega exciting, he's recently back in Birmingham, he was formerly head chef of the Michelin star restaurant Man Behind the Curtain in Leeds, massively successful restaurant, one of the best in the country, obviously that's Michael O'Hare's restaurant, it's very unique, probably one of the most unique restaurants in, in the UK. We have a good little chat about what that was like and what it's like working with Michael. Before he went to Leeds, he was actually trained at our very own Pinnells in Birmingham. So we get to hear what that was like. I mean, he didn't have any like, chef training or he didn't go to university or college of Birmingham or food college or anything like that. He just started straight in at the deep end at Pinnells. So you, you get to hear it from a different perspective as well. And also, as he talks about it a little bit in the episode, he did, does suffer quite bad with dyslexia, which kind of impacted his daily life in the kitchen, well, just everywhere really. So it's a fascinating tale. And most of you will probably know our guest, Cray, from last year, well, this year's 2019's Great British Menu. He got all the way to the final with his dishes. They were absolutely amazing. I think he had the Black Sabbath dish, the, the, the Sharon dish, which was basically like a take on a beef dinner, but just really far out there. And then he had his dessert. Yeah, and he, he was very close to getting going all the way and winning it. But unfortunately, it wasn't to be, but he's still done amazing. Um, obviously, he's a local Birmingham lad, so... It was nice to see the boys do well. So, yeah, hope you enjoy his, uh, his little story. It's fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, great tread well. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Breaking Bread. We are your hosts, Carl and Liam. 
and today we are joined by former former head chef former head chef former head chef from man behind the curtain indeed and contestant on where most people would have seen you on um, great british menu not great british bake off which i keep saying <laughs> 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 we'll obviously get on to man behind the curtain and the um, great british menu in a little bit i just want to start kind of just tell us a bit about obviously growing up in birmingham you're a local boy yeah well, sully hall i don't know yeah. some people get a bit funny well i say sully hall because you know it sounds a lot posher than where <laughs> where i'm originally from but you know some people in sully hall get a bit funny you know if you call them brummies they're like yeah. no i'm sully hall no i'm definitely a brummie <laughs> yeah, yeah that's good i went to school in birmingham <laughs> you know sully hall is where i live for my later teens but you know, before that, I grew up around. I've lived everywhere in Birmingham, really. Yeah. Uh, fr- uh, I lived in Erdington, then Stetchford, then the Glebe. Like, my mum couldn't keep a house, so, you know. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> <laughs> everywhere, yeah. So, as great as my introduction was, I forgot to say your name, which is obviously <laughs> Craig Treadwell. No, I don't need my name, mate. <laughs> e- everyone knows, don't they? I, I, I did laugh because you, you sent me a text message to say what you were wearing. Yeah. Like, in case we didn't know what you looked like. I was like, <laughs> mate, you're famous. Yeah. Everyone knows what you look like. I'm not half <laughs> as famous as I thought I would be. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so you're a local fella. You uh, went to school. When did you go to Catering College then? Or I've never been to Catering College. No? No, so I left school at 15 I actually missed my last day of school because I got expelled <laughs> which was shit so I didn't get to egg no teachers or nothing like that what, did, do you mind me asking what you got I've I don't, got to ask. Actually, I don't <laughs> actually remember you know that's the weirdest thing what, must have been like I think I took a radiator off the, off the wall and went down the stairs on it <laughs> I genuinely think that's what it was so yeah I was a bit of a naughty boy in school yeah. I didn't enjoy school I didn't enjoy being sat in class you know I've got like an attention span of like a one year old. If I don't enjoy it then I just get up and just rather just get up and just like do something else. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. So you didn't go to Caton College, did you go straight into a job somewhere? Or? So basically I left school and you know I've knew Glyn since I was about 13 years old because uh, my uncle used to be the pastry chef. At, my uncle, she- uncle used to be the pastry chef at Panels. So you know family part they're really good friends so like family parties Glyn would always come and stuff like that and um i never i always wanted to get into cooking but i was always scared you know because of being dyslexic so i was always in a way of like you know reading recipes and stuff like that and the of uh, my biggest regret now is when i first left school i got offered to go to, uh, go and work at jessica's just as like an apprentice and i didn't do it and I started like cutting hair, like boys and girls hair. And the reason I did it is because, you know, there's no reading involved. So obviously I wasn't good at school, couldn't read for shit. I'm actually a bit better now, which is weird. Um, so 100% was, down to your dyslexia. Like, that was yeah. 100. Yeah. I just thought, like, what's a cool thing to do that's quite creative without having to read anything? I meant don't you, you like misbehaviour in school would you say uh, the schools were different then like yeah ago, I think I think because I was dyslexic and I was always conscious of being bullied for it and I was never bullied at school so I used to try and act like the rebel and like show off in front of like girls and boys so yeah. because of that I think that's why I was so bad in school and also with me if I know the things that I know that I can't do so like I can see you, you can tell me the alphabet like, like, I c- do you know what I mean? I can. There's just stuff that I can't do physically, and if I don't want to do it, there's no point. There's no point telling me. That's just the way that I am. So I have to get around it other ways, which is cool because I've learned how to do other stuff. Like, you know, recipes. I just talk it into my phone, and that's how I do it. So, good job for iPhones. If I was, if I was <laughs> born like 40 years ago, it'd be shit. <laughs> But yeah, so I talk them into my phone and then they go straight onto my notes page, so all my recipes are on my phone. So my reading isn't as bad as my spelling, weirdly. So yeah. I can talk it into my phone, then I can read it. So yeah. So uh, we never got round to what was your first job then? So you done your hairdressing? Oh, so then sorry. Then? Yeah, so I did hairdressing for a bit and then uh, I was with like this girl. I had a girlfriend and she's like high maintenance because she was like fit as fuck. So like... I didn't have enough money while I was doing hairdressing. So my uncle asked me if I wanted to like wash up 
uh, um, the Asquith, which you know Ginger's bar now. Yeah. It used to be the Asquith. Jason Eves was there, and uh, just on weekends I'd wash up because I was going on holiday, and then it went from there really. So I was washing up for maybe three or four months, and then I was coming in earlier, and then after school, sorry, after work. So you still finish at five then. I'd come to town and like just help them. No, no pay or anything like that. And then I still didn't know whether I wanted to do it because it, it's easy doing it then. So like you know you're coming in helping for free. You know what I mean no one's gonna tell you off. No one's gonna say you've got to do. If you do something wrong, it's like it's free help. Do you know what I mean? You're not gonna shout at me. And then eventually, I um, I asked if I could work there. Um, and I worked at the Asquith for about two months, I think it was, until it changed over to the Bistro. But I learned so much from Jason. Like, um, he's, he's a really hard person to get along with, in a way. But if he believes in you and stuff, he's the first person that ever believed in me in anything. So he would always show me what to do. Always had a lot of time for me. He would, like, drop me home. So he lived in, like, Kidderminster, and he'd drop me home to Sheldon. And he was like the head chef. Usually he'd be like, fuck off, get the bus, do you know what I mean? But he dropped me home and stuff like that. Sometimes it got a bit intense because we'd sit in the car for about two hours and just talk shit. I was like, I really need to go to sleep. <laughs> Were you naturally good from the beginning at cooking? Or? Uh, I don't think I was as good as I thought I was, but he used to, pra- he used to praise me up um, because I think the people that he had around him at the time didn't care as much. You know, it doesn't matter how good you are, it matters how much you care. So, if you're happy to send shit, then that then that's on you. Your ability doesn't matter in that sense. Everyone can chop an onion, but you know it's it's taking the care to tr- do that onion how he wants it to be done. I think that was the difference, really. I don't think you can teach passion. Like yeah, people yeah. have natural talent, but everyone knows that. What's the old cliche? Um, hard work trump's talent every time yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah so that's what i think he's seen you in you straight away yeah yeah so like he was great with me like really like sh- showed me and like you know there was never what what he taught me was there was never a silly question yeah that's the best thing as a, as a chef to know you know he'd be like met that holland i don't know how to make a fucking hollandaise you know i grew up on cereal like i had cereal for my dinner when i was a kid sometimes like Hollandaise. I've never had Hollandaise in my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, and then eventually, he left when he um, turned over to the bistro, and obviously I was still pretty shit, or maybe like Glyn or whoever was like coming over to change it over there, didn't know actually what I was doing at the Asquith, because I was still I still wasn't really making anything, so I'd I'd come in on the evening and stuff like that, and it'd already be prepped, so I thought everything was easy. Do you know what I mean? I thought, oh, all you do, like, I'm just standing there learning how to Cornell and stuff, like, the cool stuff, do you know what I mean? Rather than, you know, I weren't there at 7 o'clock in the morning, like, when no one's in, it's freezing cold and you have to turn all the stoves on and stuff like that. So I did the bar food for the bistro, and it was so boring. Boring? Yeah, it was so boring because, um, obviously, it just first opened, not a lot of people knew that there was having bar food in the day. Obviously, the food was nice and stuff like that. It wasn't obviously e- excellent food that y- that you would eat and stuff like that, um, but you know it was good. It was a good way to learn. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously yeah. I, ne- I never had that, um, you know, that learning stage as in a sense of like when you first go to a job or catering college where you know, you know, you learn how to make mayonnaise or even burgers and stuff like that. You know, I didn't have a clue, so you know I was learning all the basics doing that, but it was just never busy. And uh, to be fair, I had I had really good hours as well. So the bar food would start at like 12 and yeah. finish at like 9. So on a Friday and Saturday, I could still go out with my mates and stuff like that. So I thought he was still eat. I thought this industry is a bit of a piece of piss, do you know what I mean? And um, and then I didn't want to... And then what happened was when it changed over, a few of the chefs left. So I thought, you know, this is my way to like get in now, do you know what I mean? And come away, come away from like the bar food and stuff like that. Which didn't... It did happen to a degree... So I got put on like the larder section at the bistro, and uh, it was very complex then. Like it was, it was similar to like what lunch dishes were on at Panels and stuff like that. So it was a lot more complex. I wouldn't say it was better than it was now because I'd say now it's more consistent. Yeah. But the food was definitely more 
harder then than it is now to make in like bulks and stuff like that especially like when you're doing like you know at panels the maximum you can do on a saturday night is 100 and that's only now it used to only be like 50 and stuff like that yeah. so you know at the bistro you can do 100 for lunch and like 150 for dinner and you don't know what you're selling either so you know it's just bang 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 and there's only like five chefs so i did the larder and the bar food and i got caught out on it one day so what I used to do is because obviously I wasn't fast or anything at the time. I was shit, like really shit. I used to like prep all the larder stuff and then fingers crossed that no bar food would come on in the afternoon. Cause I'd, and then I'd stay on my break and prep all that. And then one day I just got slammed on bar food and I had no food at all. I got pans throughout me and everything like, yeah. Yeah, it was shit. But yeah, but that's the best thing that's it. Best thing that's ever happened to me that. Because after that, then it was like, fucking hell, like, this, this ain't a joke. Like, I'd, I'm not saying throwing a pan at someone, or like, I think it was coleslaw, actually. A tub of coleslaw in my face. Yeah, that's even worse. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> but, obviously, there's better ways to go about it, but it embarrasses you, and it's in front of everyone, and it's like, you know, I don't want that happening again. Like, I would never do that to someone. But, you know, it was different then. That was like, what, 11 years ago. Um... And, you know, there was always, there was always like, more pressure on me as well. Because of my uncle working at Panels, <laughs> there was always, like, how the fuck can you do that? Do you know what I mean? There was always more, even though I didn't have the same... You know, he went to catering college. He worked at a lot, a lot of places. But I always had pressure on me to be, like, not shit, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So would you say that's, like, the kick up the arse you probably needed, really? Yeah, it was definitely the kick up the arse that I needed. Um, and to be honest, I think if that day didn't happen that I wouldn't have actually I would have just been probably working in doing chicken wings or something like that I wouldn't have had as much passion if that didn't happen because that's drive me on then to be like I know it sounds like a fucking you know a story but you know I'm not saying it like that but you know I was like nah fuck that that's never happening again do you know what I mean and then you know I made sure that that didn't happen again so where did you go from there then so I stayed there for how long was it two years and then obviously I didn't know anything about food then all I knew was that restaurant I knew of Penal's you know I knew about Michelin stars just from like watching the TV and stuff like that but then I started getting more into food and like you know and the way that I thought about it is you know working at the bistro at them times you were still doing 65 70 hours a week so you was you was doing the same amount of hours as you was doing at Penal's to a degree maybe if there was doing a few more at Penal's and obviously the food is a lot more technical but you know if you're going to spend that much time somewhere then you might as well go somewhere that's sick do you know what I mean like the bistro was good to learn but you know if you want to take it to that next level you might as well so I spoke to Luke and I didn't even know this so I was just watching like I was, how old was I I was probably 19 and you know I was just watching stuff like Tom Carriage became quite famous then and that and the Hand and Flowers and then I spoke to the sous chef at the bistro and I was like, you know, I'd love to go to Hand and Flowers. And then he told me that Luke, Luke Butcher, who's the, who was the sous chef at the time at Penals, used to work at the Hand and Flowers. So I was like, nah, I didn't, I didn't even know. That's how much little knowledge that I had. Um, so I asked Luke if I could go to the Hand and Flowers to do a stage. And I went there for four weeks. I took all my holiday and just went there. And uh, obviously Luke was close to Aaron, who was the head chef at the time and stuff like that. And they actually offered me a job at the Hand and Flowers from the Bistro, which was really, really cool. Um, but then obviously Luke found out that they offered me a job at the Hand and Flowers. <laughs> so he was like, fuck that, you might as well just come down here. So then I went, to, so from there I went to Penals for two years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so you're working under Tom Kerridge, then you've worked under Luke. And yeah, well, it was more Aaron then, to be fair. Yeah. And, you know, it was, again, it was for a shorter time. And, and it was always that, like, you know, if I made a mistake, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have mattered. But, you know, I definitely proved myself that I'd, I, could, I could mix it at that level, if you like, with them offering me a job. So, what yeah. was the, f- the difference in food between the bistro and Hand of Flowers? Um, obviously, the Hand and Flowers is like a two-star pub, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, so it's yeah, yeah. So it's not like, you know, it's not like um, it's not a linear. 
but you know it's it's doing everything properly and well and i think the difference with the hand and flowers is that was more set as like um you know it was definitely a two mission star kitchen just just the way of like you know people being in control and the stuff that they had and the hour the hours that they did was ridiculous like breakfast checks would be coming on and like you know they'd just be like they'd be prepping like fish and stuff upstairs it was, and running down to make breakfast it was like you know you could it was more of a um, it was more of a team and a goal there rather than the bistro whereas the bistro was you know nice food but let, let's churn it out do you know what I mean the hand and flowers it, it was more of a more of a lifestyle so you know the guys would live out the back and you know they'd come in at half six and it was more of like an aim, whereas the bistro was more of a job, in that in that sort of sense. Yeah, I completely understand. Like, if you got a whole team aiming for something, trying yeah. to maintain two stars, it's yeah. no joke, you know. Yeah, definitely. So you that made you probably even more of a better chef when you went back to Penales. Yeah, I think um, so. I went back to the bistro for a bit after that, a few months, and then I got told that I was going to Penales on this date, um, and I was shitting myself, literally shitting myself, because you know. Because it was di- even to the point of, you know, like, with just dyslexia always comes into it for me. To, like, even, you know, they'd, they'd send someone up to the bistro and say, um, you know, you have to do, like, fridge temperatures and stuff like that down there. So I started doing them up here. And I was like, fucking hell, what the fuck, man? I've got to go down there and do fridge temperatures. Did you like, explain to, like, the gaffers and that? Though? I've never explained it to anyone more out of, like... Um, more about about of like being imba- embarrassed really in a sense so even like the first year at Penals, I would like you know you have to label everything and stuff like that and you know I wouldn't label it I'd just put the date on it and put it in the fridge and hope no one noticed yeah. and then if they did you know I'd never ask someone to say you know can you spell that for me because it's embarrassing do you know what I mean it's like a boy kitchen and a proper like you know, you can get you can get roasted for shit like that. Not not in a bad way. They think it's a joke, but they don't know how serious it is. It's, you know a, what it's I mean? a different time as well. You're talking ten years ago. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ten years ago there was a misconception that like um, dyslexia, you weren't very smart. But now that's been dispelled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knows, so that's not yeah. True. I mean, they might have like entrepreneurs. I think the majority of like successful entrepreneurs are uh, dyslexic. Yeah, 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 maybe. Yeah. Um, I think it's changed massively. Like, um, yeah, it has, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so what was your role at Penals then? So I was a commie chef. Yeah. Um, so I was on the larder with a guy called Phil. Me and Phil are like really close now. He's like one of my best friends. Um, and he was actually like really, really, uh, he was really good to me. So he's quite like, um, like a soft soul. Whereas, you know, in that kitchen, it's quite like sh- it, at that time, not shouting in a bad way, like everything was for a reason and stuff like that, but it was quite male dominated kitchen, like a lot of swearing, you know, and I was quite shy um, when I first started. And he, and he really like helped me actually. Um, he was like, he was a bit, it felt like I was like his little brother. Do you know what I mean? So he would like, you know, he would never shout at me, tell me if I did something wrong and stuff like that. Because the way it works at Panal was like, you have a commie and a chef de party on each section. Yeah. And uh, so the chef de party is in charge. So if I do something wrong, it's him who's going to get shouted at. Then he has to shout at me. So that's how it worked there. Um, but yeah, he was really, really nice to me. Uh, a bit too nice, actually. Because I think he kept me, not on purpose, because, you know, as I say, he's like one of my good friends, but he kept me in my shell there. And, you know, I didn't have any confidence for probably the first year of working at Panels. But it didn't help that I was late on my second day. I was, I was, uh, how late was I? Yeah, I think I was an hour late on my, on my second day. It's not a little late. How come you were so late? Do I just, I just, I just overslept and I made some excuse up about, you know, my washing machine breaking, just shitting myself. At least you came in. A lot of people would yeah, have just said yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, but I had a massive, um, I remember it, I had a massive voice smile <laughs> voicemail off Luke like hello Cray it's your second day at Panal's restaurant you're an hour late uh, quite a serious like and I was like fucking hell man and then I walked in 
and it was a different environment then it was pro- it's, it's not a bad thing no one talks to you if you're late so you walk in first thing I do is go up to Luke sorry I'm late yeah okay then Dave at the time who was the sous chef there as well sorry I'm late and then sorry to Phil Phil says don't worry about it everyone else don't speak to you do you know what I mean? It's just just the way that kitchens. It's probably still like that. There, it's not a bad thing, you Is know. That because maybe it puts everyone else under the cash. You, you yeah, of course. Stay wrong. Yeah, especially the like second it. day. Like what the yeah. fuck, mate? <laughs> Can't be late on your second day. Yeah. Plus, um, I suppose when a new chef starts, they've got to trust that they can be at the same. Kind yeah, of exactly. Level if you're late on your second day, what are you going to do on your third day? Do, do you know what I mean? Like you have to like earn it there, really. Um, yeah. Was it kind of a prestige in saying to people outside of work? Oh, I work at Penals. Uh There wasn't any time for that, really. Uh, we've just been there constantly. Um, and also, where I'm from, no one gives a fuck. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, my, yeah. Even my family, like, yeah, they're proud of me. Cause, but they don't know what mission stars are. They don't know. They're just wondering why you're always at work and you're getting paid so little money. That's all they're... That, <laughs> what? You come in at 12 o'clock on the night and you're getting 16 grand a year. Yeah, I am. But, you know, I enjoy it. They don't understand, like, what you have to do. Was there a temptation in the early days to go and work on, like, maybe the building sites or something like that? You know, that your mates were probably getting decent money, plumbing. Mm. And it was, the thing is with me, it was like, I was always, obviously, being dyslexic. When I left school, I genuinely didn't know what I was going to do. I thought it was, like, going to be the end of the world. I thought I was literally going to be... Uh, so, when I was at school, I was always money-driven at school. So, like... My mum owns like a recruitment uh, consultancy. So she used to send me out to work when I was like 15 on like weekends in like factories. Um, and she used to pay me cash, which was cool. Uh, but you know, it was shit factories. Like one, this one factory was like a bacon factory in the middle of Smevik. In it, Christmas time, it was holiday at school and it was snowy. And I used to have to get the 59 bus there at half six in the morning. I literally had a pair of scissors and I was chopping chopping bacon like the packet open and then chopping it up and putting it in another tub and doing that all day and I genuinely thought that that's what I was going to have to do when I left school did that help you like when times were tough in the kitchen you thought wow I could, it could be worse I could be back in that friggin bacon yeah. factory yeah I never actually ever um, thought it was tough in the kitchen you know like obviously I'd have bad days and good days where you know I thought like people were being maybe a bit a bit too out of order and stuff like that but I never blamed anyone or anything like that. Um, there's a guy called Dave Taylor there, and um, I don't want to be rude, but I don't really like him. I don't really like him to this day. I think, you know, I have a lot of respect for Luke, um, you know, and what what he did for me, and you know. But I think there's there's a, there's being stern with someone and showing them the way, and then being a little bit of a bully, which is different. But the bullies in kitchens are the ones that are not really that good. So you have to be a bully. Do you know what I mean? You know, if you're good enough, you don't have to be a bully. You, you can already gain that respect. Whereas um, I was late again when I was... Uh, <laughs> I think it was maybe six or seven months in. And um, literally, this is a true story and it sounds like a lie. I, was, I went to sleep, fine. And I woke up late and my phone was smashed on the floor. It fell off. It must have fell off my bedside. So unless my girlfriend had gone through it at the time and seen something she didn't like. <laughs> but she, it, must have, it must have, in the night, not fell off or anything, but I must have knocked it off. And it was broke on the floor. And I was two hours late that day. And I, um, oh, this is a different story. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, so I was two hours late that day and I got told off, which I should have. And no one spoke to me again that day, which was rightly so. Uh, but there was once there when I worked there, and um, used to take the bins out quite. So commies would take the bins out quite often, and I'd always make sure, like no matter how much prep I had to do, that no one would ask me to take that bin out. So I'd always do it before someone would ask me. So constantly, and the pot wash, so like we the pot washing used to come in till eleven, I think it was, and we'd be there from seven. But it was down to me. And another guy, who was a commie at the time, called Shaq, who works at Folium now, um, to, you know, put that through. But Shaq was on pastry with Luke. So when you're on pastry with Luke, you're a bit you're a bit more prestiged. So, you know, 
if Luke needs you to do something, you don't run over and do the pots. You know what I mean? So you know, I used to make sure I was make sure I put in the pots through and make sure I took the bins out. And it was my mum's birthday, and I took the bins out, and I texted her saying happy birthday. And um, there's a camera by the bins, and uh, I came back in, and David obviously looked at the camera. The cameras in the dry stores. And he took my phone off me for the whole day and said, why are you on your phone at work? And I didn't even say it was my mum's birthday. I just said, all right, I've the, I've the phone, do you know what I mean? Give it him. And then it got to about three o'clock, I think it was. And I was meeting, my mum in, worked in town as well at the time. I was meeting her on my, on my split because uh, I didn't live at home then. And I was like, can I have my phone back? And he was like, are you not going to go on it again at work? And I thought... You know what? I work here probably seventy hours a week. Like, you know, I think some. And this is a guy who is constantly on his fucking phone. By the way, do you know what I mean? Like, never not seen him on his phone. No, I'm texting my mom saying happy birthday. Like, yeah. So I didn't really. I still respect him, but I think there's ways of going about it. Do you know what I mean? And definitely, definitely yeah. So yeah. So how long did you be at Penals? Two years, did you say then? Yeah, two years I was at Penals, yeah. And, uh, did you have a favourite dish while you were at Penals? Nah, so my favourite part of Penals was, um, you know, I, I had a really good time there actually and I think I was very lucky to like work with the chefs that I worked with. So like, I worked with Phil on the larder and then, I, and then Sam came on the larder. So Sam and Phil are the sous chefs now at Penals, so I got to work with both of them, which I'm really lucky. Yeah. Um, but Sam is a lot more stern than, than Phil. Not in a, like, or with a fuck up, but more like, you know, you have to earn his respect. He just won't talk to you in the morning. Like, there was mornings when we first started, we just didn't talk to each other, just did our jobs. But then, you know, we got on really well in the end. And we used to have, like, races on a Saturday. He'd always win. Cause he's, honestly, I've never met a chef like him. He's so good. Um, he would always win, but on, he's always, like, really competitive. So on Saturdays we used to have like races to so get the prep done first and stuff like that yeah. and then so basically when I was at Panels, I maybe got got friends with the right people so f- Dave left after a, maybe a year I was at Panels. so then Phil and Sam was the sous chefs but I'd already worked with Phil um, and I was working with Sam at the time so you know they're two good people to like yeah. you know make friends with in that kitchen and then, then I got to go on a pastry with Luke, and uh, that was so good, man. Like I remember, I remember thinking that oh, I never wanted to do pastry. Shit. Why, like, why does pastry get such a bad rep? Like you hear all kids, like chefs. Like, oh, you know what it is? It's bec- it's because you can't wing it. So yeah. if the recipe is not right and you haven't done it right, then you haven't done it right. It's nothing to do with anything else. With any with any other section, you can get away with maybe you know, not putting as much sugar in or salt or you know in service. You know you, you can get away pastry. You can't. It has to be perfect or it's not right. Did you find that pastry even harder with dyslexia as well? So I can imagine that's all the exact measurements and a lot of stuff's wrote down. And I can imagine it's a lot more precise than a lot of stuff. Yeah, luckily, Luke is very organised in a sense of that. Like you know. He had, he had like this, um, I don't know how to explain, it's like a plastic wallet, but hard plastic. Sealy bag. No, no, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a hard plastic wallet with like um, letters in it and all, all the recipes would be beyond that letter. So if it was bread, it would be beyond B, you know what I mean? So, so it went like that. And all his recipes were perfect and, um, you know, you would just have to follow but that 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 gave me the confidence actually because I'm being on pastry like you just have to follow that's the first time I really ever followed recipes that I could just look at and then I realized that you know it's only food so you know it's with we if you're making the bread it's only going to say flour sugar salt yeast water oil like they're basic things you can look at do you know what I mean it's when it starts saying bicarbonate soda when I get when I struggle so you know, which it did on some of the recipes, but you know, you, when you've worked in kitchens, then you grasp what them words are. Do you know what I mean? It's like starting school, isn't it? You know, yeah, yeah. You, you know what ponies because you see a pony, like it's just just the way they work. So 
I never really struggled with um, with it. I struggled with getting it right and and asking Luke for help, really, which was um, I should have probably asked him for more help on certain things, but. You know, I was really confident at that time. So after like being on the pastry for like three months, I was the most confident I've ever been as a chef. Because you know, I just worked with Phil and he thought I was all right, and I just worked with Sam and he thought I was all right. Now I'm working with Luke, and he thinks I'm all right, so I must be doing something right. So I was a bit not cocky, but you know, I was sure of myself that you know I can make the bread as good as Luke, not not to the same speed. But, you know, I can still get that recipe as perfect as Luke. And, you know, he's, that bread's still going to taste the same when that comes out of the oven as Luke's would be. So I was all right when I went on the pastry. And I really, I enjoyed it more than any other section, weirdly, yeah. Do you find working in kitchens like that when you've moved from the bistro that it's actually, the standard's higher, obviously, but that it's easier because you know what you're cooking? You, people can't order. There's no, like, a la carte. Yeah. It's just... You know you this is that day. Yeah, I think um, that's why a lot. I, I don't, I don't really ever want to go and work in an a la carte restaurant, and it, and it's a stigma, so it stays with you. So you know, you get when I was in Cornwall, I got a la carte checks on, and you just bam, 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 bam. You're all over the place. You know what I mean? It's natural because you don't know. You don't want to keep everything out of your fridge. You don't want to keep everything in your fridge, and sometimes you know what you're going to sell and not what you're going to sell, but I think you can be more consistent with a tasty menu. But also at Panels, it was a la carte at lunch as well and stuff like that. And there was two menus. So there used to be the now menu uh, and the reminisce, which was obviously all Glyn's old dishes from TV and stuff like that. Uh, so you still didn't, you still had to guess uh, what you was doing in a sense. And that's why Saturdays were so fun as well, because, you know, you'd have these two menus and you didn't, Half of the people would say what they're gonna what they're gonna have, but then half of the people would turn up and just say, "Oh, I will have the name menu or the reminisce, or you know, can we have the name menu, but we want to try the monkfish, you know?" So it it, it wasn't that different at Panels really, because there wasn't just one menu or anything like that, and it was all tickets, so it was it was quite similar, like it was quite old school like that, which is a good thing. So you know, you still have the a la carte and the tasting menu and two tasting menus, and Saturdays used to be really good just because I used to love guessing what I'd sell and just have enough or not not have enough and then run around for 10 minutes and after, but it was really good like that, it was really cool. Before I interrupted you about pastry chefs and why people hate doing pastry, you were just about to say what your favourite dish from, from Penals was. My favourite dish at the time at Penals didn't go on the menu, you know. <laughs> uh, Luke, like, uh, eventually got like a, a room in the back where it was like, um, you know, temper chocolate and you just create new dishes. He's, he's got it now, I think, I'm not sure. But, you know, it was just his, like, development kitchen in there. And he made a cream egg, man. And I remember seeing it, and it tasted better than a cream egg, but looked exactly the same. And I just said to him, I don't know how you've done that, but I really want to know. And I never actually know how he did it. Um, but, yeah. But my favourite dish on the pastry side is the bread, because I don't genuinely don't think that there's better bread in the country than that bread no I don't and I've had a lot of places yeah you had the bread at the start yeah the black treacle but I don't he might have changed now but yeah, the, oh really it's probably changed the egg didn't go on the menu because obviously he's got the iconic it was actually to replace the egg custard yeah but you know you can't replace that egg custard that's still one of the best things I've and it's so simple yeah yeah and everyone asks for it as well but and you know, wasn't on the menu. yeah, yeah, of course, so, yeah. So, from Penals, where did you go from there? I went to the man behind the curtain straight from Penals. So, I went there at I went and did a stage there for two weeks, and then yeah, got a job there. Yeah, it was cool. Did you, just, did, you didn't go there as a comedy, you went. No, I went to, it was it's diff, It was different at the Man Behind the Curtain. There wasn't really any positions. So, like, when I left Penals, I, was, I wasn't really a commie. I was a commie on paper-ish, but, you know, Luke trusted me in the end. That was more my, you know, it was Luke's recipes, and Luke was always after the last say, but, you know, he, he could leave me to it, where I don't think he's had that before. Like, he could leave me to it, to, and, you know, 
I would say to Luke, like, we've only got one bag of that left. Do you know what I mean? It was... I, I'm not going to say I take all, like, any credit, like, oh, it was my section. Still Luke's section, but I think he, you know, it was starting to become more of my section before I was leaving. So I wasn't a commie when I left um, Penals. And I didn't think I was a commie anyway, especially with the people that I worked under. I think leaving there, I definitely wasn't a commie, and I think they knew that as well, yeah. Yeah. How did it come about? Did Luke know, like, Michael O'Hare, or was there some connection there? No, so I just really, like, loved... Obviously, I've always been quite a unique person, as in a sense of, like, you know, try to be different. And it's not always a good thing, but, you know, if everyone's wearing wallabies at school then I'd go and buy a stupid pair of shoes that look totally different. And it might be worse. Sometimes it was worse. I look shit. But, you know, I've always been like that. And I think Michael at that time was definitely someone that was doing something totally different. And uh, I went there on a, on a starge. Luke got me the starge, actually. Um, I, I thought, because what's really good about Penals is when you've been there for so long that they... they they literally tell you or infuse you to go somewhere else and go and learn something else so you know it can never get stale you know I could have stayed at Penals I could still be at Penals now do you know what I mean and like um, you know there's not really much progression at Penals it's like especially when you start so low you can't really work your way you can only work your way up to a certain point but then there's Phil, Sam and Luke already there and you know you're not topping them so and it's good to learn uh, in other restaurants as well. So, you know, at Penals, after two years, they actually say to you, you know, where do you want to go? And they'll help you go, which was really, really good. So, yeah, Did I went in. Did you behind the and have a Michigan style when you went there? Or? It's not my start. So, I went there for starge. Um, I don't know what month it was. I don't know what the guide was then. And then I got the job and I came back to Penals and we were in service. And obviously, the guide had come out and Phil whispered into me, uh, I'm behind the curtain, just got a star. I was devastated. Genuine, yeah, genuinely devastated. Because, you know, you want to be somewhere that, that you know, gets the star. I thought, when I went to my star, I was like, this is getting a star. You know, you want to be part of that. You don't want to miss it. Um, yeah, and I just missed it, yeah. so. How different was the food? From Penals? Yeah. Yeah, totally different. Like, um, when I started there, you know... They, they didn't have many chefs and stuff like that and you know at the Man Beyond the Curtain there was more of like a life balance to work like where at Penal was it was more like you know you get your two days off a week but you know the rest of it you're in from seven till till midnight on a Tuesday it could be some days you know what I mean whereas Penal was it was more like you know we want to have fun as well like you know you need to live life and stuff like that where Michael was very good at like you know it was shut Tuesdays you know, we would start at 10 in the morning. We weren't open for lunch on Wednesday and Thursday. So, you know, there was, there was, there was less, less greed about the restaurant. It was more of like a balance. Whereas, you know, we can make enough money doing this. Let's just be happy and just do this rather than coming in on a, on a Tuesday morning doing, and prepping and doing two people. Like we might as well just fill Friday night and then we're ready for Friday night. It was more like that. Completely down to my quarter thing yeah definitely down to michael like i think he's 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 very much like that where he wants you to you know in, enjoy your work and do it properly but you know you can only do it properly if you're happy and if you're working somewhere 80 hours a week it don't matter where you're working i don't care what you say you're not happy you can't be it's impossible it's like prison it's prison yeah like so you're saying the food was completely different yeah the food was the food was completely different, but the thing is with Mike's food, like people try and labour it as style over substance, and you know because he uses bright colours and different ingredients. But you know, I went there and I tasted. Ev- he gave me everything to taste, and I didn't think that at all. I genuinely didn't. I thought like everything was really good that I tried, and I didn't expect it. I thought I was gonna. I didn't know what to expect to be honest, but it you know, so different to any food I've tried. Like it's yeah. There's a what's the prawn on the telephone? Yeah, the prawn on the telephone and seeker prawn. Yeah, but that is literally. So Michael's very clever in like you know, he knows what people want to eat. So you know that prawn on the telephone there is at the man behind the curtain. It's the best prawn you can buy in the world. It's on a telephone, but it's literally like. 
it's a tikka prawn um, that you can get from a, an Indian restaurant. It tastes very similar, but just a little bit better. But Michael's very good at knowing what people want to eat, rather than, you know, asparagus and nasturgeon puree. No one wants to eat that. It tastes like shit. <laughs> Let's just be honest. No one wants to eat that. You tell yourself you do because it's in these fine dining restaurants and it's, you know, you know, like foraging for this and that. No, man, it all tastes like shit. No, there's no better food than takeaway food, is there? Exactly. So why do you want to eat a fucking a fermented onion that's been there for ten years? So really, is the opposite of style he is, he is, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah, if any of our listeners haven't seen that dish, I'll put a photo up on the show notes. Yeah. It's iconic, man. Have you seen it, Carl? Yeah, I've actually, yeah, I've seen that dish. It looks good. To be fair, I remember when he first came on, this might be a good segue into Great British Menu as well, because that's where I first became aware of Mike Lerr, when he was a contestant on it. Yeah. And I remember seeing his food plate on plates, and I'd never seen, I was like, Which, is that all edible? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Away. Yeah. I think, like, with anyone's food, like, um, you know, there's always inspiration from other chefs and stuff like that. You know, no one makes it up. It's the same with fashion. You know, it comes back around as there's no one that you know made it up. But I think Michael now is is definitely in a position where you know all his plates and all his influences is a hundred percent him. So that telephone was definitely his idea. You know, it was based around an artist that put a lobster on a phone. You know, and no one thinks like him like that. And whether you like it or you hate it, you have to respect it, I suppose. So how did you work? So you started there and you weren't head chef then, obviously, but you no, ended up no. head chef. So how did you end up from getting there to head chef? Um, the thing, I think it was more, I'm going to be honest, it was luck, to be honest with you. So like, you know, when I worked at the Man Beyond the Cut and there was only three chefs and Mike, so there was Luke who had worked with him at the Blind Swine, Matt Blackwell, who we knew from York, and Adam Rasburn, who um, who who came for his wife was the restaurant manager, and they needed another chef, so he came. And um, yeah, there was only them, and then it was me that came in. So you know, Luke went to the Rabbit in the Moon. Matt went to live in Australia, and Adam, you know, was at a time there he wanted to move. So and you know it just slotted in really with luck that you know I was I was next in line really for that position it's luck that maybe it is a little bit lucky that you got to that position like by a little bit of default but it's not luck that you kept that position and no no it wasn't luck that I kept that position I don't think but you know at the, I think I'm going to be honest the man behind the curtain it's the easiest place in the world to be a head chef <laughs> why? Because, you know, all you have to do, all, it's it's Michael's food, like 100%. Like, you know, there's points where, you know, he, he will say, you know, I want to make drumstick ice cream. Like, let's get some drumsticks in and make a drumstick ice cream. And then you have to come up with a way to make that. And then you'll give it him and he'll try it and say it needs this, that. But in the end, it's his. No matter how much work you put into making it, he's tasted it and said it needs that, it don't need that. So it's his, it's his what recipe. What's the craziest thing you've come in and asked for? Uh, <laughs> Hello Panda ice cream was a bit of a mad one. You know Hello Panda, the sweets, the yeah. Asian sweets? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I made ice cream out of them. It just tasted like a, tasted like a chocolate bourbon, to be honest <laughs> But it was cool because it was hello. But no, it was for um, you have a restaurant in Manchester, yeah. Audley Edge, and it was for a pop up there. So it's an Asian pop up. But you know, he's had some he's had some blinders, but he's had some bad ones as well. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, some terrible ideas. But he's first to admit that as well. Did um, you ever get to say to him, you know, hey, Mike, that that's not the best. <laughs> Scrap that, mate. Yeah, of course. But you know, he'd always know as well. You know, he's he's. You know, he might look the way that he does and act the way that he does, but, you know, he knows food. Like, he's worked at... People forget where he's actually worked. You know, he's been at Noma, stuff like that. He was a pastry chef at John Burton Race. You know what I mean? He's not just a gimmick. You yeah. know, he knows his food. Like, yeah. How much input did you get on the menu? Zero, 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 zero input on the menu, mate. Maybe, like, um, 
you know it's different at the man it was different at the man behind the curtain in a sense of like you know at Penals it would be more like you know Luke Glenn Sam and Phil that would have ideas and they would be brought to you know you was never never involved in any of it whereas with Michael it's totally different so he'll come in and say I had this idea I, what can I how can I explain it what dish the prawn let's say the prawn you know I've had an idea let's put the Denny a prawn on Tika Spice on the telephone but then you know you'd met the Tika Spice and you know you'd come up with a recipe for that but in the end obviously you would give it to him and say what do you think of that and they go shit good or you know it needs this it needs that how many different recipes would you end up having to give him for one day uh, probably four or five or like sometimes you would just like you'd get bored of giving it him so you'd just like fuck it off and then <laughs> hope he forgets which sometimes he did yeah so obviously you've gone from there how, how did you end up on Great British Menu um I don't actually remember how I ended up on Great British Menu I think obviously you know they were looking for new chefs on there like, like they always do and stuff like that and you know I think Mike mentioned you know if I wanted to go on it to me I said yeah then he mentioned it to them because obviously he was the judge and then just went from there really yeah that's a was it daunting the idea of going on it considering all the chefs that have been on it before um not really because I think I don't want to be rude to like the, the program or anything but it's not the same is it like you know I'm not going up against Daniel Clifford and Sat Baines and Glyn Penal and Mark Lair. I'm going up against like you know some people on there I don't even know they've got on there like you know like literally pub pub chefs like and I didn't I didn't I wasn't I was probably arrogant and thought no I'm not bothered like I watched the series before and I thought you know it's not that great to be honest my year was actually better than the year before I think especially with especially with the chefs like especially in finals week like they were people that you know deserved to be there and stuff like that I think you must have been excited how it's it's made a lot of chefs into kind of household names yeah it has it only benefits you for what you do after so you know if you don't have a restaurant or you know I think it benefits you more if you've got a restaurant or you know, you work in somewhere that's prestige or something like that. But, you know, it's easy to be forgot about. Like, I went to Dig Buff Dining Club the other night. And have you ever watched... Uh, you watched X Factor, haven't you? Yeah. You know uh, Mason Noyes on X Factor? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember him? Yeah. Yeah, mate, he was serving chicken wings behind the counter at Dig Buff Dining Club. That's how much it can change, do you know what I mean? So unless you have that restaurant, that, you know, that back in and stuff like that, you know, there's a lot of people that have come through, but the only people that have come through really are the people that have had that before, and the, are the old names, yeah. So Tom Kerridge, Daniel Clifford, Glyn Pennell, Sat Baines, they was already prestige chefs. Michael O'Hare already had a restaurant. What was the TV program really like? Uh, I've, I've heard a lot of rumours about like runners and producers like sabotaging like dishes and. Uh, to be honest with you, I think it's, um, you know, I don't think it lets you truly be who you want to be. It's a bit, you know, do you know, it's a bit like a film, like, you know, you're not acting, you do have to be yourself. But, you know, if you're having a bad day, you're having a bad day, like, stop trying to cheer me up, do you know what I mean? Like, whoo, in front of the camera, you need to be exciting, you need to be this. No, man, I just want to be who I am, do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not the Hunger Games. <laughs> like, <laughs> look off. It must have been a bit daunting cooking for Paul Lane's work. Yeah, it was actually. I didn't think, um, I genuinely, um, I thought, because, you know, you have, you not don't have a, you don't, you don't know, obviously, who the judge is. But I had an inkling because on the back wall, so all the chefs that are contestants are on this wall, and then the judges are on the other wall opposite you. But straight down was two chefs just on that wall on their own. It was Paul Ainsworth and um, Tom Aitkins. And I thought it was going to be Tom, any? And I was like, fuck's sake, man, I don't want Tom. Do you know what I mean? He's a nutter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, you're not the first person that's done Yeah, this. not a nutter. That's a bit harsh. But, you know, like, I didn't want him. Like, I thought he's not going to get it and that because, you know, he's quite very classical. 
And like, you know, I remember someone doing a consomme on there, went to Vagar and he ripped them to shreds. It was like, you know, you need to do a proper consomme. I was like, he's just not going to understand what I'm doing here. You must have been still happy with your um, all tens for your dessert. Yeah, I was happy. And if I'm going to be honest with you, I don't understand how that didn't get to the banquet. Um, you were close. I mean, I think you got to it. You were in the final three, weren't you, in the last Yeah, season, yeah. So. Um, but, you know, with the competition as well, like, you know, it's a good competition and, you know, it's good for chefs to, you know, showcase what they can do and stuff like that. But, you know, I think, you know, there's a lot, I wouldn't say politics, but, you know, there's a lot of favouritism and, um, you know, you don't get judged on just this year. Do you know what I mean? So... You know, they were the judges. The fo- you know, like with a bo- it's the same with boxing. Do you know what I mean? We yeah. can all watch a boxing match tonight, and you two can think he won, and I can think he won. But the only people that matter is the three judges that score the fight. Yeah. Everyone has an opinion on it. Do you know what I mean? Um, and you know, I think with that, it's like you know they do look into last year and what happened last year and the year before. And you know, I genuinely believe if I was to go in that competition this year that I would win. And I think I could put up shitter dishes than I did last year and win. Yeah. Because yeah. of the outrage of when I actually lost the dessert, like, they have to have to. It's the same with, like, Tom Brown. Like, you know, they had to put him through that year because he's Tom Brown and, you know, he did so well the first year. With Lorna, Lorna had to get through because she shouldn't have, she shouldn't have lost the year before to yeah. someone making a fucking nettle cake. <laughs> like, who the fuck wants to eat a nettle cake? Yeah. I don't care what it tastes like, man. It's a nettle cake. Was that still something in your mind when you were doing the, the competition that the food you made was still something that they wanted to eat? Yeah, I wasn't really... The thing is, I wasn't really bothered about getting through. So I was more bothered about getting through to Friday, which was my main goal, because no one wants to go out first. And I thought the judges are either going to just shred it to shit or they're going to enjoy it. So either way, I'm either going home or I'm not. I think I was very lucky that I actually went through. I think if Sabrina cooked like she did for Paul, I wouldn't have gone through. But, she, you know, she undercooked the Wellington and stuff like that. So, How did you find coming up with the food to match the brief that they set for that year? Um, I think uh, what I tried to do was, you know, I think for me it was more like the brief was more important than the food because, you know, we can all cook... So, like, anyone that goes on that competition, you don't get on it without knowing how to cook, whether it's at that level or this level or whatever level. You can all cook food. So if you don't hit the brief, then what was the point? Which I genuinely thought, like, not being rude to anyone, but, you know, no one hit the brief that well. Like, no, that, that year was different. Yeah. Well. So usually people hit the brief all right. Yeah. That year, like... Hardly anyone seemed to even yeah. notice. And I just, think, the song in the background I just and think it was a lot of cop-out, do you know what I mean? Like, And, you know, I think the brief was really important to me to show that, you know, you know, it's to do with me- music. Like, it's not that hard to, to hit the brief. You can't just give me, like, you know, like... I don't even know who to say, to be honest. Okay, the guy... The guy I was up against literally just did a Sunday roast and tried to name it after a song. No, man. Like, it makes no sense. Like, it either has to look like it, it has to have a connection to it. You know, you've had all this time to prepare for it and the best that you've come up with is a Sunday roast with a song in the background. Like, no, man. Like, well, you compare that to your um, Sharon dish. Yeah, like yeah. Beef one. Like, yeah. That looked, it looked like Black Sabbath on a plate. Yeah, well, yeah. thank you. I was really impressed with that. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that's what I tried to do. So, like, I tried to make it look as interesting as it tastes. And, you know, I probably, you know, I, f- I thought too much about it in a sense of, you know, I thought I was only, to be honest, I thought after Friday I weren't going through and this is before the competition started. So I thought if I do dishes that look like the look, um, you know, people at home don't eat it. Do you know what I mean? The, the, no one gets to try it. So all they can say is, wow, that looks fucking sick. There's only f- there's only three four people that are trying it. One's Paul, and the three judges. Um, so yeah. Nice. Um, did you get any? Did you speak to sort of Glenn or Michael about how to go on it? Yeah, cool. I got a lot of help from Michael. Um, a lot of help, as in the sense of like you know he funded the plates and stuff like that for me. Um, he 
help me with certain dishes like the punk dish the studs were probably more michael than me if i'm honest like he had the idea for the studs obviously he didn't make them he didn't dip them spray them or you know but i think everyone in that finals week had had some sort of help from from who they were working for you know i went i came joint second with someone who did paul ainsworth's dish that paul ainsworth won the show with yeah. he did the same dish <laughs> like and he conferred and no one's mentioning it like no one said did not did paul ainsworth not do monkey red no one once said that or they did but they just cut it off camera so i think everyone gets help but you know also when you're there you're on your own so it don't matter what someone's told you to do before it or showed you what to do you're on your own and you've got to do it for yourself so yeah with the but the dessert actually so i give it to michael maybe three times before i went on the tv never finished and he just slagged it every single time <laughs> You did like this could be cold, eh? could be, but he's always like that anyway. Like, and it's a good thing he wasn't doing it to be a cunt. But I knew it was right. Do you know when you know something's right? And I thought, you know, I'm not giving you again. I'm just gonna. And to be honest, he didn't ask, and uh, he didn't ask to try it again. And I think he just left me to it. Do you think that criticism was coming from a loving place, though? Like, if you just, yeah, yeah, you definitely. Knew it was, no, it was yeah, yeah. But he just wanted to push you. No, he just wanted it to be better, but. Is that you know, what it's like anyway in the kitchen? Yeah, yeah, like no, nothing's perfect for him, which I understand that totally. But I genuinely, hands on heart, thought it was perfect. But there's different stages of it as well. So I give it to him at first and it wasn't wasn't how I wanted it and stuff, you know. And then, you know, the next time you give it to him, it's a bit better and a bit better. And then there was times where, you know, I'd get nervous to give it to him and all the dishes. So I used to do them on Saturdays. Uh, he used to come in on Saturday morning uh, or he used to have his son on Thursday morning I'd do it then and I'd get the guys in the kitchen to try it and almost like shut Michael out of it because you know I didn't want because you know it's good to get criticism but you know when you're just about to go on the show the la- you don't want doubts in your head it's like, and I don't think he meant it like that at all I genuinely don't like he did just want the best but I thought you know what I'm just going to go with it now and see what happens so yeah after the great british menu you went back to obviously well you you didn't leave but obviously you went back to your kitchen and stayed yeah. at the uh, man behind the curtain yeah what one lesson would you say you learned from working with michael here uh a lesson in in what sense sorry like something you could take with you that something you've learned and you'll take with you oh you i've learned so it. much from working for mike um you know how to treat your staff number one so important that a restaurant's not just a, not just about food. So when I worked at Penal's, um and wherever I've worked other than Penal, uh, other than the Man Beyond the Curtain, you know, chefs are so involved in the food and the food side of it, and just oblivious to everything else that's around it. Like you know, the chairs, the tables, the cloths, you know, the music. You know, it, you know, you can go and ask ninety five percent chefs in the country what music is on in the restaurant and I ain't got a fucking clue and it's so important because it just sets the vibe do you know what I mean like yeah yeah yeah. it has to be like you so the man behind the curtain from as soon as you walk in that door till you leave you know where you are you know whose restaurant you're at and I think that's the biggest thing I learned of like you know thinking about everything like to the point of like where there's people that are coming in that can't read the menu because they've left the glasses at home Michael's got five pairs of glasses that they bring over to the table <laughs> to say, there you go. Just f- everything is thought about, not just the food. That's amazing. I almost want to go without my glasses just to get the glasses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I normally ask chefs when we have them on the show, is there a lesson like, or what's, what their best piece of advice would be for any young chefs coming through? But for you, I'd like, what would be your best piece of advice to a young chef who might have dyslexia? Um, to not be embarrassed about it, to be honest about it, and don't let it hinder you. You know, there's certain ways that you know you can just get away. You know, every everyone has something that they're not stronger, but you know, you know, you get you get away with it. You can you you can be better at other stuff or learn to live with it. Like you know, my phone now is literally like like my best friend. Is in a sense of I just talk to it. If I've got a recipe, 
that I've just made, I'll talk to my phone and it will write it down. So if I give it to someone else, they know it. Because I can write it myself, but only I will know what that says. You know what I mean? Yeah. So do you think you've found your style now for how you're going to be moving forward? Um, I think I have found the style of restaurant that I want and the vibe that I want it to be and the clientele that I want to get. But I think with food, like, you know, you're always going to learn and you're always going to be different um, and you're always going to, you know, it's like fashion. Do you know what I mean? Like that hat there, you're not going to wear that in 10 years. But in 20 years, your son might say, Dad, can I wear that hat? Do you know what I mean? It's just what happens. It just comes around like that. So I think food, you can never just stop and say, that is your style now. Do you know what I mean? But I think I've got a basis that I want to go down and, you know, I just want to make food... You know, I want to try and cook for people like that, you know, that are not into fine dining. And I know everyone says that, but, you know, I'm from that. So, you know, I didn't know anything about f- fine dining food till I was probably 18. I even worked in a kitchen. I still didn't know. Like, I want to know none of my friends have ever come to eat in any of my restaurants that I've ever worked in because they're scared. Because, you know, there's, you know, for one, it's a 400 pound bill. <laughs> so, yeah, do you know what I mean? That's scary. Yeah. Secondly, there's a tablecloth. There's no music. There's people standing there like they're in the fucking army, watching you. You have to have a wine pairing. I don't even. Some people don't even like wine, but you know, some guy comes over to you in a suit, asks you what you want to drink. You don't fucking know. They don't do Peroni, so like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I want a Peroni. Oh, sorry, we don't do Peroni. Oh, what do you do then? Oh, we have this wine flight. Oh, yeah, I love that. I don't like wine, but, you know, it's just scary. So I want to change it. I like, I want a restaurant where, you know, you can come in, you can have a tasting menu for £50. You can spend what you'd spend at Nando's. You know, the music is what you can relate to. The restaurant looks like it's what you would relate to, but the food's still good. And I think that's the best way to get young people into food, and especially my generation. So how are you moving forward? What are you looking to do now, then? Well, I don't know, to be honest with you, mate. Like, I'm, obviously, I've had my pop-ups and stuff, but, you know, it's hard, It's a hard one for me now because um, it's harder for me now to get a job than it was before I went on the TV. And that sounds weird because, yeah. you know, um, there's, there's restaurants in Birmingham where I'd like to be the head chef at. Um, there's, there's the owners that are chefs and, you know, they don't want someone with more fucking Instagram followers than them, or, do you know what I mean, or than... You know, it's stupid. Um, but I think for me now, it's just getting that... It's getting it right. So, you know, I could go and work in a hotel tomorrow and earn 100 grand a year. No, I could just walk in like that. But it's going to be shit. The food's going to be shit. I'm not going to like it. And it has to be the right step. I'm not willing to take any job tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? I'll, like, I'll sign on before I go and work in a, sh- in, in a shit restaurant. Do you know what I mean? Because I've worked too hard for that. The hotels, they just sound the complete opposite of exactly what you've just said, is yeah. all, what you're all about, so why would you do that? Yeah, because money talks so sometimes, isn't it? Yeah. It so if someone yeah. says, oh, come here, you can earn 75 grand a year, yeah, but then you get there and it's like, Souls. fucking hell, what the fuck's going on here? And I just want to say to all chefs that work in shit hotels and stuff like that, where you're working 65 hours a week doing fucking fish platters, get out of there, man. Because honestly, you're not learning anything. There's plenty of restaurants where you can get a job that you will learn. And you work in the same amount of hours than you would in them restaurants. And you obviously care because, you know, you get up for breakfast at half six to do fucking fried eggs. Like, I understand that some people, you know, that's what they want to do. But, you know, there's a lot more out there than just to do that. And you, you literally, you're getting used. Do you know what I mean? You're getting used. You seem quite like annoyed that people people don't realise. Yeah, because I literally. That got. So, I'll be honest with you. I went to a hotel called The Elms. Yeah, they offered me like seventy five k head chef, and it's such a beautiful place. Like, um, I went there, spoke to the guy that owns it. Um, he was like, you know, we want to get a Michelin star and stuff like that. I was like, this is perfect. You know, I've never worked in a hotel. It's a different thing. Like, you know, I think, you know, I can do it. I can still think I can do it. No, I'm not saying I'm going to go there and put the teddy bear on. Do you know what I mean? Because you, you, there's, there's things that I'd work, but, you know, I can definitely cook. Just because of where I've worked doesn't mean I can't cook normal food to a high standard. So that, and, and 
you know, I think what's good about me is I know what food works where. Do you know what I mean? So, you know, if I went to, to a hotel tomorrow, I'm not putting the teddy bear rice pudding on. I'm not putting my GBM design. It doesn't make any sense, you know what I mean? But, you know, I can still cook, like, a perfect sticky toffee pudding, stuff like that. And I was really excited to go, you know. And I went there. I was really excited and I walked in and I was like, what the fuck is this? Literally, the pans must be about 30 years old. Like, there's, like, grease on the bottom of them about two inches thick. You know, there's no kitchen porter. Like, they're doing breakfast, then brunch, then lunch, then dinner. They're open for food 14 hours a day. Six chefs just in there all day, sweating the tits off, getting paid fucking peanuts, and then living round the back of it in some fucking staff accommodation that like you just a mattress on the floor get, literally getting treated like like dogs and to work in a shit place where you you know it's a five million pound building like what are you doing like the owner's got a Lamborghini and his staff are fucking sat outside in a like living on a mattress like it just doesn't work like that do you know what I mean so anyone that's doing that get the fuck out <laughs> that's, that's probably the best piece of advice we've ever had yeah. on the show, to be honest. I love that. We, we kind of brushed over it, and if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But yeah. um, why did you leave the man behind the curtain? Um, I think after the TV and stuff, you know, um, I made a few mistakes maybe with Michael. Um, but, you know, it was a, it's, it got weird, man. Like, you know, when I'm in his, I'm in his restaurant, and, you know... Even when he's there, when he's not there, people are asking me for photos to sign the menu. And as I've just said, all the food is Michael's there. You know, I've got people on Instagram tagging me and stuff saying, you need to try Cray's uh, Denier prawn on the telephone. And, you know, I reply saying, it's not my prawn. All the food that the man be on the curtain is Michael's. But then, then, just a paranoia of like, oh, is Michael going to think I think that prawn's shit now? Because I've said that, like, oh, it's not my fucking prawn. Or does he think... Oh, he's saying, oh, it's not his point. Do you know what I mean? It's just weird. It was, it was weird from both from both ends, really. And, you know, and I think it's a time where, you know, I, w- I want to try and do do what I want to do and not just, like, stand in the shadows of Mike. And, like, you know, I could have probably worked at the Mumbi on account for the rest of my life, but it depends what you want to do as a person, doesn't it? Like, I don't want to do that. I want to have a restaurant with different music to Mike different venue different chairs diff- you know my own you know, was, that is already set in stone of what that is I don't want to keep going back to the show but do you regret the show a little bit no I don't regret it I no. thought it was sick I got a 10 from <laughs> Paul Ainsworth mate I was buzzing my tits off <laughs> but um, I, reg- I don't regret the show but I wouldn't go back on yeah I but because I, I think also it's just like with anything like that I think like you know, for me as a chef, like, why the fuck am I on there? Like, Brad Carter as a Birmingham, a restaurant in Birmingham, you know, he's one of the most underrated chefs in, in the fucking UK. Like, only for the last three years people have recognised what he's doing. He's been there for ages, mate. Like, he's had a star for ages and no one thought, what the fuck am I doing on there? Do you know what I mean? Making studs. He got a star in his first year. Yeah, man. exactly, mate. Like... Nah, I think it was like, f- yeah, yeah, yeah. He used to do Sunday dinners, I wanted to try yeah. Sunday dinner there for ages, and then he stopped doing it when he got a start. But, but you know, I re- I'm glad that I did it, and I'm really, really grateful that I got the opportunity. And I think I did well, you know, getting to the finals for the first, to- for the first time and stuff like that. But I wouldn't do it again, because also, I've, uh, what I realise is, you know, the brief doesn't, doesn't matter at all. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't, because I'm, I'm proven that... Like, no one else, apart from me, has proven that the brief doesn't matter. Because no one's ever matched the brief like I did. And I still didn't get through. So that means that you can literally do a beautiful plate of food. Because my, my biggest... Uh, what angered me about the show is when someone would do a restaurant plate of food and just put, like, a note next to it. <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Also, I can't even read the note. Like... <laughs> 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 What's going on? So, you know, and then I realised as I was on it that, you know, it doesn't matter. And I think, you know, pricing comes into it, everything like that. Like, 
I love Adam Reed so much. Like he was so good to me on on the show and stuff like that. But you know, he said it perfectly. He said, "I said Adam, I don't know how you fuck you've won that main course, mate. I'll be honest with you." He said, "I did roast chicken for a banquet. No one's not gonna like roast chicken, yeah. and it's cheap." I did Wagyu beef, mate. Like yeah. the fuck, it would have cost about twelve grand if I got to the banquet. Yeah. But you know, it's thinking like that and being smart like that and stuff. Obviously, Birmingham food seems getting better and better. Is it viewed by yourself and other chefs around the country as the Birmingham sort of a really good place to be now? Yeah, I think Birmingham's a good place to eat, and um, you know, there's a lot of like new restaurants about, isn't there? But um, you know, I still don't think there's that unique place where you know. Like, I'm actually, like, you know, with Birmingham, I think, you know, you've got the fine dining restaurants and then you've got the chain restaurants. There's nothing in between it. That's good. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's, Little Blackwood's a good Yeah, yeah. But, but like, not, there's not a lot for a city yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. you know, London's the only biggest city. You know, if you go to Leeds, there's all these little places. Or if you go to York or Bristol, or anywhere, you know, there's a lot of independent restaurants that, you know, I'm not bothered about putting, like, two things on a plate and a 12-course tasting menu. Like, I think that's what it's missing, the in-between stage of, like, you know, you've got your high-end restaurants. But if you don't want to go to a high-end restaurant, not because you can't afford it or anything like that, you know, you might just want a burger. But where are you going for a burger? Yeah. Where are you going for it? Exactly. A chain. I'm going to, Ma- yeah, but I'm going to McDonald's over that, mate. Because McDonald's is good, ain't it? But there's no, like... No middle ground, I think, yeah, which is which is yeah, yeah, yeah like which is disappointing, I think. So but I think that's the thing with like arrogant chefs. Like, this is what I want to change now. So, I just want a place where you know you can come in, and you can get chicken wings, but they're the best chicken wings in Birmingham, and they cost you like three quid. And you know, it's going to be a queue outside for the chicken wings because yeah, I think yeah, like we wings. have to stop pretending that everyone's got loads of money. Do you know what I mean? Everyone's into food. Everyone's getting into food. And everyone keeps saying, oh, the food scene is, like, amazing now. But we destroy it as well. Because, you know, if you're not that in that bracket of, like, that you can afford to go and eat at Pinal's, Carter's, Adam's, but you're still into food, then wh- what do you do? Do you know what I mean? There's no one that's, like, in the middle. But there is, but the shit, aren't they? Do you know what I mean? There's no one that's actually, you know, working as hard as them restaurants... And just doing normal food or, you know, even burgers and stuff like that. Like, there's no middle ground. No, as I said, I can only think of one restaurant in the whole of Birmingham. And that's one of our favourites, Little Blackwood, that are even close to something like that middle ground. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were opening a restaurant, your own one, would you want it to be in Birmingham? Yeah. Because I think that, like I just said, but I wouldn't, I don't, I'm not bothered about fine dining food anymore. I'm bored of it. It's boring. Everyone, everyone does it. Everyone puts some like, pickled on, and then there's a vegetable, then there's a protein, and there's a powder. Like, it's so pretentious now. As in, like, you know, you have to do fine dining. No, you don't. You just you think that's what you should do because you know everyone wants this lifestyle about being like a top chef. Like everyone forgets that you know you got into food because you like cooking food and. If you're honest with yourself, as a chef, like, fine dining food isn't, you know, I've been to some, some of the best restaurants in the world. I'm not saying I don't like going eating these restaurants. I do, I love it. But I also like going to it, I have a burger, a perfect burger and a perfect fries and a perfect mac and cheese. You know what I mean? I also like that. And chefs forget that. They just go from zero to 100 and forget that everyone forgets the middle bit of like, and that's why... Like staff, like the best book to get is Brad Carter's staff book, because yeah, 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 it is, man. Him. It is the best book, like in the in the whole country right now, because there's a lot of chefs that can't even cook staff food. If somebody opened a restaurant just doing them staff meals, yeah, yeah, they'd exactly. Be packed, yeah, they'd yeah, be rammed, exactly. That's food everybody wants to eat. But mate, honestly, there's so many chefs that can't cook staff food. It's unbelievable because they don't know how. Like you, you're right. You know, if you say let's say the man behind the curtain, you know, you can do the abalato twirls, you can do the white chocolate twirls because you've been taught that. But you can't cook a spaghetti bolognese because you've gone from working in like, you know, somewhere where you do probably like frozen food, and then you come here. 
because you know there's not a lot of chefs anymore and you get taught how to do that but then when someone says make me a shepherd's pie you ain't got a clue because I've never made a sh- well I have but you know they're thinking I've never made a shepherd's pie I've never cooked at home I'm not even at home to cook there's, that's what I mean by the middle ground in between the day you open that kind of middle ground restaurant, does the day will come? Yeah. <laughs> 100%. Need some money, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll probably wrap this up now. Yeah, it's cool. a lot of your time. But no, I'm all right, mate. A lot of ranting. Massive you know thank I mean? you for coming on to the podcast. It means, some ma- it means loads to us, doesn't it? No, nah, thank you for yeah. having me, man. I really appreciate yeah. it. Everyone just keep an eye out because don't, you don't need me to tell you how talented Cray is. So just thank keep you. an eye and s- follow him on Instagram. And it's Instagram probably the best. Yeah, Instagram, Instagram just yeah. I don't use Twitter because it's full of knobs. It is definitely full yeah, of knobs. Yeah, so um, <laughs> just Instagram, really. Yeah. Di- Twitter's a bit addictive as well. I don't <laughs> I like it, mate. It's just like, it's full of slagging people off, isn't it? Yeah, yeah I'm all about it. Can be. Yeah. <laughs> so follow him on Instagram and keep an eye out because you want to catch one of his pop ups or something he's doing brilliant because he will be doing brilliant things. I can Thank you. It. Thanks a lot, Craig. Cheers, mate. Thanks Cheers. for having me. Thank you.